Good afternoon. I'm Jonathan Barsade, president of the America Israel Friendship League. Thank you for joining us today. This is our second webinar on the topic of Israel's financial investment landscape in partnership with Blue Star Indexes. As we start, I would like to let us know where you are joining from. Please write in the chat window. We always like to see these. And one answer to a recurring question, by the way, is that yes, we will be posting a recording of the session for your continued enjoyment and sharing with others. Also, if you have questions, please write them in the chat, time permitting, we will bring these up uh, to be addressed uh, by the panel. This is our 25th webinar that we're streaming during this period. Throughout these webinars, we're focusing on messages of hope, unity, compassion, optimism. When planning the, uh, for this webinar, I was asked, you know, shouldn't be removing the post-COVID from the title? And we were thinking about it, and the answer is definitely no, we should definitely keep that name. Because even though we're going th now through the second wave of this COVID, we also have to continue remaining optimistic, and we will have to look at the day beyond especially when talking about investments and capital markets. Investments by definition are things that we look forward at. Investments are made because of an anticipation of a future return, a positive outcome. That's why we have with us this panel of experts today that will be talking about their analysis of what Israeli capital markets will look like the day after COVID. With us today are Hila, Imi Albelt, Hila heads Discount Capital, which is the investment banking arm of IDB Israel Discount Bank, one of the major banking groups in Israel. Hila comes with a joint legal and business background and joined Discount Capital after other positions at investment banking, such as Giza Singer Evan, Israel's leading investment banking firm, and as she also has private equity invest experience serving on the board of several leading Israeli portfolio funds. Another investment banker is Nati Ginol, who is the managing director of the Israel desk at Jefferies, a leading U.S. investment banking firm who splits his time between New York and Israel. Brian Friedman brings us the macro perspective. Brian is an economist and he's with the Israel Investment Fund, a group of U.S.-based investors who focus their investment research on Israeli stock market opportunities. Brian has been through many of these cycles, stretching way back to the era of the 80s and Israel's hyperinflation and the economic stabilization plan that implemented it back then, which I believe is a case study. Finally, co-hosting with us is Stephen Schaufeld, founder of Blue Star Indexes, a research group that maintains the Blue Star Index of Israeli markets. Steve founded Blue Star after a career managing investment arms at Northern Trust and Barclays Global. I'll turn now to the panel. So, starting with you, Brian, with the population closing on 9 million, I know that we've had, there have been sort of debates, what exactly is the population of Israel? And I think we, what we've seen is that, depending upon the source, it ranges anything from 8 8 8.5, 8.6 to like 9.4. But with that kind of population, should we really be considering Israel as a developed country? What a great question. In fact, Jonathan, I'm gonna answer your question, but if you don't mind, I'll just provide a little backdrop uh, relative to what you just mentioned about my biography. The first time I visited Israel, it was 1984. The inflation rate was approaching 500% GDP was $30 billion. Average income in the country was $6,000 per person. The Israeli government had just nationalized its entire banking system. And two thirds of the Israeli economy was directly owned either by the government or quasi governmental organizations. Over the last 36 years, as you just mentioned, the population grew from 4 million to more than 9 million. GDP is now $375 billion, up from 30, as I just mentioned. 
GDP per capita, average income per person is $42,000. The inflation rate is one of the lowest in the world. The debt to GDP ratio fell from 150% in 1984 to 60% just now prior to the coronavirus, 20 percent percentage points below the United States. By any definition, Israel has emerged. It's emerged to become a highly developed economy. There are only 25 countries on the planet Earth with GDP per capita in excess of $25,000, and seven of those accomplished that feat after World War II. Israel is one of the most rare specimens on the planet, a highly developed, fully industrialized, wealthy economy poised for more. Well, I think that definitely answers that question. Thank you. I mean, I think that is fascinating information. Uh, so turning to you, Nati, I mean, you've focused also on the Israeli market for now for over 10 years. Uh, what is different today that you would say that you saw 10 years ago as we were going through the economic crisis of 2008-2009? Uh, uh, Nati, you're on mute. Nati? I'm sorry about that. Um, I agree with a lot of what, what Brian just highlighted, and, and it's interesting that you bring up 2008 and 2009, because coming out of the global financial crisis, Israel, not surprisingly, as it does from, from many challenges, recovered very, very quickly. Um, and as a part of that, Israel, I believe it was in 2008, Brian, you'll probably know, was you know, upgraded right from, uh, from MSCI developing to MSCI developed. Um, 2010. So, uh, and part of that analysis was because of how quickly that economy had recovered. And watching what's happened over the last 10 years, it, it literally looks like a different country than it did 10 years ago. You know, I think back to um, when Google acquired Waze, which many of you may not know is an Israeli company uh, for a billion dollars. And it was celebrated as kind of the biggest, you know, exit for an Israeli private company. And it was a billion dollar company. Today, there are 20, 21 companies valued at a billion dollars um, versus one in 2013. Uh, there's a, another term that we like to use called charging ponies, which are kind of the next upcoming unicorns. Uh, and, and those are companies that have raised capital at um, you know, $500 million value or above. There are about 60 of those. So it's an entirely different country than it is today. Um, the other thing I would point out that's very interesting is that usually the investment kind of case in Israel was really controlled by, you know, a few early stage, large, high quality investors in Israel, Tango, Viola, firms of that ilk. Uh, I was actually just looking at a presentation that we did for a company last week that I'll just kind of quickly flash, but each of those is a headline in the last one year of a large global private equity firm making an investment in Israel. So you're seeing a huge inflow of global very high quality capital in Israel for the first time ever. It's uh, it's as exciting an economy and an opportunity as I've ever seen in my career uh, and why I four years ago switched to focus on Israel full-time and not just uh, part-time. Thank you. So Stephen, I mean, you also have a very significant background in market research. Um, can you also give us maybe some additional context of how the Israeli stock has performed in the past? <laughs> as against uh, sort of its developed market peers? Uh, certainly. Um, so uh, we mentioned Israel's graduation from emerging to developed. Um, it happened with the FTSE family of indexes in 2009, with the MSCI family of indexes in 2010. And that's also when the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development um, uh, brought Israel in. So that was sort of its anointment as a uh, developed economy. Uh, we founded Blue Star right after that because when Israel went from being a medium-sized emerging market to a, rel <clears throat> a relatively small developed market, it actually got lost amongst the large investors investing in developed markets. So we created the Blue Star family of indexes for Israeli equities to actually track this performance and to answer the question you just asked. Uh, Brian and Nati and I and Hila can... can 
wax poetic about how great Israel's economy is, but investors want to know how did it do? What was the performance of Israeli equities? And now that it's a developed market for 10 years, the right way to compare Israel is against the full universe of developed markets. So in America, we use an, an index called IFA. Um, over the past 15 years, so this is the five years before graduating and this decade, uh, as of yesterday, so this is data updated for the end of the quarter and the end of uh, the middle of the year, annualized an investment in Israeli equities using our Blue Star Israel Global Index has doubled the performance of developed markets. Uh, over this period. So if you put the same amount of money in the broad developed market basket, whether it's 10,000, 100,000, or a million, you would have done twice as well in Israeli equities. That's a long term, that's 15 years. That includes a lot of crises, which we'll talk about, and that includes the coronavirus crisis. To give you a short term perspective, the same comparison uh, during uh, the first half of this year, the half of the year that just ended, Israeli stocks outperformed developed markets by 500 basis points or five percentage points. This is absolute number, not annualized. And in the year that just ended, so June to June, 750 basis points. So in the space of relative returns, how does Israel do compared to the developed markets? The answer is terrific. And it sounds as if it's pretty unequivocal. I mean, it's not sort of even marginalized based upon these numbers that you're sharing. Correct. And, and just one other thing, this is data that we provide publicly. Anyone participating in today's call can go to our website or go to Bloomberg and get this data. So this is out there for investors to do their own analysis. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So Hila, shifting to you and shifting on a forward-looking basis, um, do you see uh, these kind of trends continuing? I mean, what, what kind of advantages do you think that the Israeli companies will have on a go-forward basis? Ila, you're on mute. No, I'm not. <laughs> so I have to tell you that uh, due to the situation in the Middle East, uh, Israeli companies have been known for their ability to treat uncertainties and to do it with a lot of flexible thinking. Um, there is a, a word that I like to use quite a lot uh, in the last uh, few months, which is resilience. <laughs> I think that resilience is very important when you come to treat, uh, to manage a company in such a situation. Um, this crisis today is focused on health and uh, social distancing, which can be partially bridged by uh, technologies. Uh, along the years, I think that uh, it's been mentioned in the statistic that Nati has mentioned before, uh, along the years, um, Israeli entrepreneurs have, have positioned themselves as uh, uh, developers who, who knows how to invent new technologies, which addresses the needs of the market, sometimes needs that nobody understood uh, that exist. And I think that Waze was a nice example, but we've seen quite a lot of companies ever since. Uh, due to the COVID-19 and the fact that we said that uh, the social distancing is a part of the phenomena, I think that the adoption process of those technologies and more of that, I think, it has been accelerated, but more of that, I think that in some cases, uh, the need for such technologies has become much and much and much stronger. So I think that looking forward on the uh, Israeli companies, you could see that uh, where the Israeli has the strength, which is technology, this, uh, um, um, uh, this crisis has increased the need. I would like to give you an example of one or two of, from our portfolio company. There is a company which is called uh, Talkspace. Talkspace, probably Nati knows them very well, and some of you as well, is an online and, and mobile therapy company. Prior to, the, uh, prior to this crisis, it was a very strong company, nicely growing, uh, double-digit growth, and its main focus was in the periphery areas of the, uh, where the supply of therapists wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't good enough. If you look at these uh, uh, days and what happened during this crisis, uh, due to the social distancing and due to the implication uh, of this crisis on people's mental health, uh, health and the, the, the state that, that they are in, you see this company thriving and you see the need increasing. 
So in the fact, you thought that this is a company that will operate on the periphery, but you didn't expect to see it operating in, in downtown New York, because if you want to go through all the therapies, you could do it across the street. Another nice example, I think, is a company named Joytune, uh, which, is, uh, um, which developed a music learning uh, uh, software. So it allows everybody to become musicians from their own room. Again, in the past, it was quite, you could imagine people uh, uh, trying to learn uh, um, how to play a guitar from their own room, but most people will go to do it in a group. Uh, in this crisis, you could see companies such as that, uh, uh, you see the, the need growing, and I think that we are expecting to see that uh, 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 the way people are um, uh, acting will change due to this uh, uh, crisis, and I think the changes will be bigger as long as this crisis will be longer and longer. So that's a good opportunity for those companies. I, I would actually love to add one thing, if I may, just you know, sure. another interesting example, because a lot of the Israeli technologies are, are, are just that, as Hila points out very adeptly, are about um, increasing efficiencies, reducing costs, solving problems. Uh, and so actually that's one of the reasons that a lot of Israeli companies actually perform incredibly well through, thick, through difficult times, which is kind of an interesting dynamic. And, and as Hila was talking about her two very good examples, I was just thinking of another one or two that are worth mentioning, just companies we, we've come across recently and spent time on. Um, you know, one example is a company called Nuvo. Nuvo is uh, a telemedicine company. Many of you may be familiar with telemedicine, especially uh, with what's happened in recent months, that does remote patient monitoring for pregnant, for prenatal women. And we've been monitoring the company for quite some time, forgive the pun, uh, and, and, and taking uh, advantage of understanding what their strategy was. And then all of a sudden, in a matter of the last few months, all of these pregnant women were separated from their OBGYNs. The company got FDA approval. And now all of a sudden, there's tremendous demand for their technology. Uh, another company recently in the news in Israel is called TitoCare, uh, that has an incredible device that effectively is a doctor visit in a box uh, or in a, in a device and also telemedicine. Uh, and they just raised a, a very large round with some very high quality global investors and are off to the races. So um, I think it's a really interesting time in almost all of these sectors to see how, you know, Israeli innovation already is kind of solving a lot of these challenges. It's pretty remarkable. You know, uh, if I may add, our fund focuses on more mature, profitable, already publicly traded companies. But one of our larger holdings is Nice Systems. And everybody in Israel knows Nice, but many people outside of Israel do not. They are really the gold standard when it comes to uh, call centers, what are now becoming what they call contact centers. And this entire shift oh, uh, towards greater distance has really been a boon for their business. It's been um, a boon for a whole set of activities that weren't previously part of con you know, formal contact centers. And so all up and down the value chain from startup to more mature companies, um, Israel is in many ways benefiting uh, from its prior technological um, expertise and the base that they built over the last several decades. But it is interesting, I would say, to note that, I mean, even in this situation is, uh, like some of the companies that Nati was mentioning, is it's not so much a question of luck, but it's a question really of being ha having the right technology in place and knowing how to take advantage of it and adapt it, basically, to the current circumstances, which I think uh, is also very indicative of what you were talking about now. And actually, I would just add, because it goes to your earlier question, Jonathan, about what's different today. Israel always produced great technology, but now they're producing great companies. And that's a big difference, right? They were producing great technology, but they were, you know, thinking of it as a technology. Now they're building businesses, they're building companies. And that's a very big change. I think that's why people constantly say, you know, it used to be a startup nation and now it's a scale up nation. Um, you know, that's, that's one of the biggest changes I've seen as well. Interesting. So, um, but move, moving, I mean, so another interesting thing, though, is that I think, uh, Brian, a question to you is that, like in the United States, the Israeli government is spending a lot on supporting the unemployed there now and jump-starting jump the economy. Now, there's a lot of debate you know, uh, right now, I think, 
even today uh, with the um, um, Ministry of Finance and um, uh, of the putting together like new packages. Um, do you think how will this be supported? Will, will it be supported by additional debt? How do you think this uh, kind of government spending will also impact spending on infrastructure and just impact? Um, or you know, do, do you think there's a risk of us going back to high, days of hyperinflation? Uh, we're supporting this by printing more money. I mean, what, what are your thoughts about uh, what's going to be yeah. what's going to happen? Great question. It's exciting to talk about technology, and that makes up the second largest sector in our fund, about 25%. Um, but even bigger than that in our fund is um, financials and real estate and infrastructure. And one of the reasons is, if you look about pre-coronavirus, and then we'll talk about post-coronavirus. Pre-coronavirus, as I mentioned, the Israeli government was very good about it was very fiscally responsible over the long term. They substantially reduced their debt to 60% of GDP. They're the least indebted country in the developed world. Now along comes coronavirus. And just like the United States, uh, Israel has had to enact a series of relief and eventually stimulus packages, which will most likely, according to my estimates, boost the debt to GDP ratio by a minimum of 10 percentage points and maybe as much as 20. So 70 to 80 percent debt to GDP. That's quite a radical uh, turn of events. In fact, even in wartime, Israel did not raise its debt level by that amount. Now, previously, when it was uh, constrained fiscally, one of the downsides was underinvestment in infrastructure. All you have to do is look at Israel's public transportation system, some of which is only coming online now. Tel Aviv is just getting a uh, rail system today. It probably should have had one 30 years ago, for example. Rail between connecting more distant parts of the country, roads. Um, there's a massive urban redevelopment uh, wave underway and there's tremendous opposition. Why? Because there's not enough parking, there's not, the roads aren't wide enough, there isn't enough sanitation infrastructure. One of the things that the Israeli government has learned during the coronavirus is that it can sell its debt to global investors in large quantity at quite modest interest rates. And I think that when we come out of this crisis, they will use that new, newly discovered borrowing capacity to great effect to uh, boost um, infrastructure spending and accelerate many of the trends that were already in place. We can talk about some of those later, but just take one, urban redevelopment. Israel, and more specifically, the center of the country is being transformed. I estimate it's a $400 billion opportunity in the next decade just for residential construction alone, like you mentioned with uh, the rising population, plus on top of that, another three or $400 billion for the infrastructure to support that urban redevelopment. Technology is 8% of GDP, the rest of the economy needs to get the same attention, and I believe that it will, facilitated by some of Israel's newly discovered ability to raise and deploy capital for infrastructure. Interesting. So, I mean, that sounds actually as if a lot of this debt uh, raising could actually go a, a long way to sort of support and um, essentially innovation and, and small industries. Uh, I, I mean, Steve, would you agree basically that, um, th that I mean, wh what's your sense basically of how the, all these activities of the debt issuance, uh, how will that affect basically and encourage inve the investment climate? So <clears throat> it's really a, a two part answer. Uh, I wanna reinforce what Brian said and just really emphasize how impressive the ability of the Ministry of Finance, the Israeli government, to raise sovereign debt uh, from international investors during the midst of the coronavirus 
um, crisis, including the first ever debt issuance into Asian investors. That, that is like the ultimate hexer, the ultimate good housekeeping seal of approval on the Israeli economy. Uh, they will use that money first and foremost to support the economy today. Uh, there's a lot of businesses, just like in the United States, that are under stress. There's a lot of unemployed. They'll, they will have the firepower to do it. It's important also to say that Israel entered this crisis in really good shape. As Brian said, record uh, low inflation, record low unemployment. So it has the resources to now spend money. Um, the other part of the equation is the Bank of Israel, Israel's central bank, who just like the US Fed implemented a major, major quantitative easing, record purchases of domestic bonds, essentially injecting money into the economy. That's to support the overall economy. But as far as supporting small business as well as innovation, um, there's many programs as part of this 100 billion shekel uh, rescue package that is gonna go to small and medium sized industries to support employment. And one other factor, and it's also a factor in Israel's tech success, is the Israeli Innovation Authority. It used to be known as the Office of the Chief Scientist. It is unique amongst developed nations, I would say unique in the world, at having a government office that supports innovation, supports science, supports basic research, and supports startups, supports new companies. Now that, that is gonna continue, that is not gonna abate, but the Innovation Authority working together with the Israel Securities Authority is working with Israel's domestic institutional investors, Israeli pension funds, Israeli insurance companies, who so far have not heavily invested into Israel's tech ecosystem. And they're using this crisis to create a backstop to encourage local investors to invest in Israeli tech. And so when you think about um, what uh, Nati and Hila talked about, uh, the startups that are scaling up, those become public companies that funds that track our index will invest in, that Brian's fund invest in. And this is gonna create a very positive, virtuous circle of more domestic Israeli investment into tech combined with more foreign investment into tech. And I think just as Brian is optimistic uh, about the overall economy, we're gonna see a revolution in the way tech is invested in. I would add to that another thing, and, and, and Steve, you know, you're, 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 you're dead on, uh, but I think also there's a point worth making about your specific capabilities and Blue Star specific capabilities. You know, one of the challenges we hear from investors that want to express a constructive view of Israel and want to invest in some capacity in Israel is, you know, so much of the innovation is for export that sometimes Israeli companies are listed in Israel or in the U.S. or in London or in Australia or in Toronto and how. Can you get exposure to either the broader Israeli company or specifically within tech, as we like to joke, you know, the, the, the Israeli tech index, uh, the iTech uh, fund that, that, that Steve index that Steve uh, manages is oftentimes called the exit index, right? Because these are the companies that are, that are acquired often by, by large multinationals. And, and I think what you've constructed, Steve, uh, is a very interesting way to kind of get that exposure to Israeli tech, to Israeli companies, because it captures them regardless of where they're listed. And that's a very unique, uh, ability to express a constructive view on either tech or Israel more broadly? Well, that actually ties into a question that just came in uh, from Milton, uh, is the, the fact that it's really, I mean, I think Israel is very much known for the tech industry. It's very much known for all these exits and everything, but isn't that, and the question is that, isn't this a, actually a problem that Israeli startups are sold to foreign companies and they therefore there's sort of a hold back on, on, on their growth. Uh, and does this, is there a risk of a brain, uh, of a brain drain from Israel because of this? Well, I should probably let Eli answer some of this, but I, I do want to take one moment, if I may, just because I think it's something we spend a lot of time on. Um, we agree. And, and one of the reasons that Israeli companies sell so often is because going public and raising capital in the United States has become a higher and higher bar to, to achieve. Uh, they could grow a great company that could be a four or five, six, seven hundred million dollar company, and it still might not be suitable to go public in the U.S. because of how high the bar has gotten. And so one of the things we're spending a lot of our time on, and, and I think the team all knows this, and Elon, and Steve, and, and Brian, uh, you know, is that is that we'd like to be able to help uh, more of these companies go public in Israel. 
but not just market to Israeli institutional investors, to market themselves globally. Uh, there are today, just like Brian and, and many of the funds that, that we know, uh, that invest globally. They don't just invest in the U.S. or in London. They invest you know, around the world. And why can't Israel be an incredibly robust mid-cap exchange uh, to enable companies that are based in Israel to raise capital and grow and hire and acquire other companies instead of being acquired? Uh, I think that's a really important thing to help Israel in this kind of next leg of its journey. Hila, you know, sorry, I'm sure you have something to add. Oh, that's fine. I, I have to tell you that Israel have evolved in the past 10 years. And if you would look at the, at the history of Israel, those companies would have get sold for 40, 50, 60, or 100 million dollars. And then you would see the entrepreneurs going to uh, build another company and another company. Hence, serial entrepreneurs, those are the ones that we like to invest the most. Uh, what change in the past five years, I think, is that we've seen more and more local local and international uh, growth money coming into Israel. So the ph phenomena that we see is that more and more companies are growing into a 400, 500 valued company, and that, cre that increases um, 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 the time they spend inside of Israel. And I think that is important, as opposed to the past, that after uh, that every startup would be, be sold after, I don't know, three or five years. Today you see it more and more, and we see the exit at higher numbers. It is correct that there is a, a risk of uh, those people going outside of Israel, and we see it more and more. I have to say that some of them are coming back now, these days, before because of COVID-19. So sometimes the nature makes sure we fix things. Uh, but not only that, I think that Israel... Uh, Israeli likes to invest and to keep on doing in Israel things. So they come back, they invent another company, and then they sell it. And some of the company stays in Israel, uh, but uh, at least they, they get sold at a higher uh, value with uh, much more uh, um, employees. Uh, and, the, and I think that's uh, um, a good process. Uh, can I, I just want to add one more thing, um, Jonathan. Uh, this issue is, again, another reason why we created Blue Star, because as Nati said, our index, the public companies, the Israeli companies that choose not to sell early, such as Wix. Wix decided to go public, and now it is a $12 billion company, which, of course, the jobs, 2,000 of their 3,000 jobs are literally in the Tel Aviv port. But when these companies do exit from our index, meaning they've grown up as public companies, and they are acquired, such as when Mobileye was acquired by Intel, they're too big to be moved. And in fact, Intel had to make Jerusalem the headquarters for their global mobility business. And you see this over and over. And what has happened is, as foreign companies do acquire Israeli companies, mostly in tech, but not just in tech, they end up becoming more connected to Israel. And uh, Blue Star, aside from having indexes for Israeli stocks, we actually have a database of foreign companies, companies that you all know, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Intel, that have a strong connection to the Israeli economy. When Intel acquired Mobileye, the CEO at the time said, I consider Intel as Israeli as American. And what we measure is, would this company be the same without their Israeli connection? And we're seeing more and more companies, our database now has 400 foreign companies that are very active in the Israeli economy. And this is, is a real evolution that is only going to grow over time. Sure. Well, I, I think also, just, frankly, it's historically, I mean, to Hila's point, uh, you, you saw that back from the 70s and 80s, I mean, Intel created its presence in Israel because, uh, you know, return of the, of the engineer back to Israel. And, right. You know, Many of the companies, basically, that's that's how they started from uh, there. They started off from a small research around somebody wanting to come back to Israel. And they built up a very large presence there. Uh, but really, so Hila, um, you know, looking forward, um, what's your expectation from the 2021 M&A market? I mean, how, how do you think it will look like? So I have, um, I think that we've, we, we, we spoke quite a lot about the uh, um, prosperity years that we had in technology sector. Uh, but I have to say something about the contrast that we've seen in the past in the traditional economy um, 
um, such as industrial, agriculture, and services. In those areas, we've seen stability in the amount of deals, although I have to say we've seen a, gr uh, a growth in the value of, of the exits, same as we've seen in technology, but uh, there was, I think there was an abnormality in the Israeli market. Uh, a lot of uh, private equity money, local and, and international, was uh, looking for deals in Israel with a lot of dry powder. And on the other hand, uh, I think that in the last two or three years, we've seen a lot of sellers looking to sell companies, but uh, we haven't seen a lot of deals get signed. And that was abnormality. And I think the reason was the price expectations. Uh, the sellers wanted to sell at high prices while the buyers wanted to do a multiple of two or three times on their investments. And I think the market was, uh, was freezing uh, from some perspective. Um, I think that what's interesting when we look at the future, the post-COVID-19, but I have to, say, to tell you that it started already, is that there is a lot of liquidity in Israel uh, in, the, uh, in the local funds, there is a lot of liquidity. Some of them are raised, have raised just before the crisis. Some of them are raising right now, uh, but a lot of liquidity and a lot of money. And on the other hand, we see sellers going into more and more rational prices. Uh, it's not that we see a bargain, okay, a, a deal which is in a very low prices, but uh, reasonable prices. But I think more important is that what we see on the seller's side is that they want to de-risk their position. In the past, you would see people saying, I think that my, my company will grow and grow, so I don't want to sell. And now people understand that they are very much focused, especially family-owned businesses. They are very much focused, uh, and all of their capital is focused on the same, on the same asset, and they want to see de-risking. So we are starting to see more and more deals in, the, in these areas. I, I want to give you an anecdote. Just February, you know, like four months ago, we were uh, working with a company, with a tourism company, on a deal to sell. It's, it was a, a 70, 70 years old a, a, a shareholder, which built a, a nice tourism company. And, you know, we've worked for almost a year on a deal. And a day before signing, in which he was about to sell his company in a very high multiple, he decided that the price is not high enough. And he stopped the deal. Now, I don't need to tell you what happened a month later. He's left with no company, no operation, and the 150 million uh, shekel valued company is now worth nothing except for uh, debts. And I think people understand that. Uh, and I think that's going to accelerate the market and it's going to create a movement in the market. Um, I, I just want to say one more thing. I think that this is the situation right now. You see movement, you see people willing to sell in, in reasonable prices, but if the crisis will continue as we see it now, and if it's gonna be a very deep crisis, I think we might find ourselves with more and more sellers, and then we're gonna see a significant decline in prices, but I think it depends on the, uh, how long this uh, crisis is gonna last. I, I, I agree, but the one other side of that and, and and i think it is a debate and I, i'm not sure which way i i see it at this point but you know in the last few months as i mentioned you've seen real top tier private equity coming into israel i mean just this week and last week you saw kkr and bain you know make first investments in israel in in a very long time and so it is also becoming more competitive uh and there is some scarcity uh to to, to a lot of these assets uh and so watching this play out over the next year or two uh will be very very interesting and not to be, uh, in that regard, how would you compare this to the prospects of, uh, I mean, how would you compare the Israeli and, and the U.S. market? I mean, when you sort of look at both. You know, it's, it's hard to say, you, you know, on one hand, um, you know, as much as Israel produces unbelievable technology and with unbelievable frequency, um, right, relative to, to the rest of the world, um, there is a fair amount of liquidity locally, as Hila points out, in the local funds. Uh, you know, as, as Steve pointed out earlier, you know, I think the, the example of the Innovation Authority, what they're doing is, again, an example of how Israel is on the kind of, on the front feet trying to navigate uh, these things. They felt there might be a risk to global capital coming into Israel. Of course, it 
appears there isn't, but, but what the government was thinking in the last several months was, all right, this is a problem. Let's address it quickly. There's a lot of money locally. How do we get it to come into the tech ecosystem and support the growth and hiring and, and quickly came up with a plan through the Ministry of Finance and with the ISA and with the TAS to fund, uh, to help support the Israeli institutions, the pension managers, the insurance companies, the asset managers to invest in, 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 in growth companies. And so I, I think you're going to see more and more opportunity uh, in Israel uh, and more and more capital coming into the country. Um, you know, from a growth standpoint, I just think it's, it's, it's much more rapid than even you're seeing in the US. To put it in a little bit bigger picture perspective, um, and this connects to the prior question about so-called early exits. Think about the word that Nati just used, ecosystem. And you think about the food chain. At the early end of the food chain, you have venture capital investing for startups. As those startups mature, they have a couple of options, particularly as they become more profitable. They can uh, sell to another larger company. They can go public and put a big marker there for one second. B larger private equity funds then step in. They also step in with sort of mid-sized uh, companies that are a little bit older, like Hila just mentioned. Israel compares to the U.S. very favorably at the early stages of that food chain. They, they, uh, for startup capital, venture capital, even in the mid-range, you're starting to see improvement, as they've just mentioned, with private equity. But it fails miserably at the top end of that food chain when it comes to large-scale capital raised through capital markets. Now it's been improving, particularly for debt, for corporate debt. But as far as equity goes, they are still uh, very substandard. It's one of the reasons we started Israel Investment Advisors, just like Stephen mentioned, uh, Blue Star. Why? Because the next phase is, uh, of development in the capital markets is going to be in that area. The Israeli government, the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange converted to a private company and went public itself. The uh, flow of capital coming out of the pension system into the capital markets is increasing. Israel is a very high savings country. And as a result, and by the way, the Israeli government is actively breaking up the monopoly power of the big banks, the large underwriters, the pension managers, those are the reasons the capital did not flow through the markets. And it's one of the reasons that Israeli companies, particularly high tech, had to exit early. When you see the stock market expand in scale and scope, you will also see Israeli companies expand in scale and scope before they exit or get sold to a foreign company. And, and Brian, just on, on the point you made about the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange going public on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, um, we led that transaction. And it was an extremely exciting transaction to be part of because it was the first Israel listing, right? A company listed on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange that actually was marketed to global investors in over a decade. And 88% of the shares went to global investors of very, very high caliber, uh, really top tier U.S. institutions. Uh, and I think that is a real paradigm for what could be the art of the possible. Uh, and how, if Israel, uh, you know, the Israeli, the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange would fit so nicely in, for example, the NASDAQ OMX. They own all the Scandinavian exchanges. That, and that, even though it's a sale of a national asset, that would start to really bring capital from around the world. And I, obviously, that's what I believe they're positioning themselves to do. Yeah, and we're looking at uh, probably seven other companies that we think are absolutely qualified to go public in Israel, but to attract significant global interest. Uh, and that, that should really help get more and more global investors transacting in that market and only increase the liquidity, as you point out, help these companies continue to grow and scale. So, so if I understand correctly, Brian, what you're saying is you're not concerned that of the risk, basically, of the government re-engaging uh, in some kind of monop monopolistic behavior to protect industries like they did in the past. But to the, it sounds like you're, you believe that it's to the contrary. 
that the foundations there are going to prevent that from recurring. You know, over the last several decades, every Israeli government, whether it's from the right or the left, has doubled down on the transition to uh, free markets. Now it's a slow process. And for example, just last year, it took several years, but one of the key transactions, um, and maybe Nati and Hila know more about it than I do, but the um, Ministry of Finance wanted to inject more competition into the banking system. So what did they do? They forced the large banks to spin off their credit card subsidiaries with the whole idea that those credit card subsidiaries would form the nucleus of new banks because there's only three major banks in Israel. The three big banks control 80% of all lending in the country, that they would create two new uh, large banks. And then by the way, after a period of time, those big banks could then get back into the credit card business and create a great deal of competition. So no, I, and that's by the way, on top of another set of laws that were passed six years ago called the deconcentration laws, which um, as Hila just mentioned, a lot of that investment banking activity was the restructuring of these large business empires that were controlled by what Israelis like to call the tycoons. They looked a lot like oligarchs, but unlike the oligarchs in Eastern Europe, the Israeli state took away, well, didn't take away, forced them to sell their assets and inject more competition into the economic system. And in fact, they just passed another law last year where they uh, changed the antitrust authority to the competition authority with a much broader mandate to pro promote competition throughout the economy. The Israeli government under Netanyahu, but all Israeli governments, I think there's a net, maybe Hilla can tell us she's on the ground in Israel, but I think there's a national consensus that, guess what, we may not like it, but we're moving deeper and deeper towards um, a more competitive free market economy that, uh, and we're not going back. But the second derivative of that is also fascinating, right? Yet again, how, how the Israeli companies navigate curveballs. In the case of the, the banks, right, and the credit card divisions having to be sold, what did they do? Very quickly, they managed it. So in the case of, let's say, Bank Leumi, they sold it to Warburg Pincus, one of the top global private equity firms on the planet. What did Bank of Pauline do with Isracard? They took it public in Israel, and it was multiple times oversubscribed. So very quickly, two very different paths to address this issue. On the anti-concentration issue, Phoenix Insurance, one of Israel's best insurance companies, uh, had, to, had to navigate this. What did they do? Sold a huge part of it to, to, to Centerbridge, another very large, high-quality global private equity firm. So each of these curveballs has resulted in a home run of sorts uh, for the ecosystem. And I think that's a very interesting point to make. So I guess, the, I mean, we've been hearing a lot of positive things and, uh, you know, the, the uh, question from Seth over here, uh, which is, I, I would say would loom on anyone's mind is, what are the storm clouds? Where's your concern? What, what would keep you up at night? Wayne, let me, can I start with that? Um, sure. Not Wayne, Wayne. sorry, <laughs> Jonathan. Um, well, let's start, one of the reasons we created the index and create, have a history, our index goes back to December of 2000. So we can overlay the performance of the index with um, geopolitical crises, with global economic crises, with pandemics, with small scale terror attacks from uh, Gaza by Hamas, larger scale attacks by Hezbollah from Lebanon. And one of the most fundamental answers to that question that we have found, and, and our data uh, proves this, is um, that in general, equity markets are forward looking. Israeli companies not only are resilient, as we discussed um, here, and are able to navigate um, closed airports, closed seaports, <laughs> going into uh, bomb shelters, but they also stay focused on the market. And what we've found historically is that when the, when the issues are local, uh, whether it's terrorist attacks or, you know, Syria in crisis, the Israeli market generally will, might react in the short term, but picks itself up and keeps going on the fundamental trend. When it's a global crisis, such as what we just had, 
for what we had in 08 or 09. Israeli companies are participating in the global economy, and they, they of course, are affected. But Israel has local institutional investors that if foreign investors flee, the local pension funds, the local insurance companies, and even retail investors will come in. And so we produce this geopolitical chart. Any of the participants can go on our website, contact us, request it. And it shows Israel's uh, evolution during all of these crises. Um, the other point that we've identified is that Israel still has two economies. It has the globally uh, uh, focused companies, whether they're tech or Israel Chemicals or Teva, and it has the local economy. And so clearly retail, real estate, tourism is more affected by the COVID crisis than tech exports. Uh, we have data that shows how they perform um, and it doesn't diminish our long-term bullish case on Israeli equities one bit, but it gives you the tools to navigate. Um, yeah, funny, just yeah. to add, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Brian, please. I was just going to say, obviously, security is issue number one. It's the number one issue in the debate, in the political debate. It's the main reason why economics uh, is a more consensus issue because it always comes in maybe second or even less to security. Um, you know, I've listened to some of the top uh, generals describe Israel's current defense strategy as cutting the grass, which I, I, I think that's a good expression that, hey, we can't dislodge the Iranians and we can't force them back. But we gotta, as the lawn, if the lawn grows taller, we, every once in a while we gotta cut the grass. So obviously, if they miss something, and if they can't fully dislodge the enemy, then uh, there's opportunities for negative surprises in the security front, and uh, of course we worry about that. And despite the resilience that I totally agree with with Hila. Um, it still has resulted in periods of significant declines in GDP. For example, the second intifada from peak to trough, over four years, GDP fell 12%. Companies survived, but um, it wasn't a great period for investors. So obviously security is number one. But number two, I completely agree with Stephen. If you look at the performance of the Israeli markets, global economic events tend to have much more magnified impact than uh, security, and my own view is because Israel can defend itself. And I just wanna connect the dot to the most recent global bond issue. One of the bonds that Israel issued, the Israeli government, was a 100-year maturity. And that was not issued to Zionists and Jews in America, that was issued to global investors that obviously believe that 100 years from now, the Israeli government will pay them back. By the way, I believe in the state of Israel, but I wouldn't have bought the 100 year issue at, I think it was a three point, I don't know, maybe you guys know, I forget the interest rate, 3.75 or something crazy. So, okay, four points. <laughs> you wanted to say something? What, what, what's concerning you? What, what clouds do you see? No, I think I think Brian said it better than, than I could, and it was very similar to, to what I was thinking. But but I would point out that it's true. Um, there will be challenges, whether they're geopolitical, whether they're global pandemic, whether they're security. But um, but but the resilience and the bounce back is is pretty remarkable. Each and every time that you look at some kind of black swan event in Israel, uh, and then you look out six months, uh, you see that it's come back stronger uh, and 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 more uh, quickly than before, uh, and so. While there will, of course, be challenges, um, I have very little doubt in their ability to navigate those challenges, uh, pivot, uh, and, and use them as a springboard for continued success. Hila, when you look, I mean, obviously Israel, over the last you know, two, 20 years or so, it's been a hotbed of technology. Um, do you see this changing post-COVID or, I mean, what other industries would you be looking at? Um, I, I think that I will start is, uh, with the part of, do, you, do I think it's going to change? No, I don't see it changing. 
Um, I think maybe the ecosystem will be even stronger post COVID-19 due to a few facts. The first fact is, this, is what, I, what we've mentioned before. It's the fact that we see the technology accelerating, the need accelerating. So I think it gives a, a good boost. Uh, but I, I do have to tell you that I don't think everything is good. You know, um, after what we've said so far and, and a lot of uh, what my, my uh, uh, friends has, have mentioned, I, agreed, I agree with, I think that it's important to mention that this crisis did not skip the technology companies in Israel. Okay? We can see uh, a slowdown in the, and decline in the uh, overall sales of those companies. And I think that the sale process takes longer and longer. And I think that uh, the ability to grow like they used to grow in the past in a no-flight world is difficult and challenging. And I think that uh, uh, the concern, although uh, Nati what he mentioned what he mentioned before about international money coming, I think there is a concern that less and less money will come to Israel in a situation in which um, we will see this crisis going longer and longer than expected and deep, deeper and deeper. So I think what we are seeing, what I'm seeing is that um, Israeli high tech company are facing for, I would say, the first time in the past few years with the question of liquidity. Will I be able to raise uh, funds in the next year and a half? Uh, up until now, uh, we've seen companies which were very much oriented on growth, and the only issue uh, uh, measurement that they were uh, that uh, uh, the investor look, looked at is how how fast are you growing, and we see those company today uh, uh, starting to focus both on cost saving and efficiency, and those are things that were very common on the traditional uh, economy, but less on the uh, on the technology economy. So if I look post COVID-19, I think that this could be a nice lesson uh, to the startup in Israel. And I think this could change and maybe even strength uh, the uh, local ecosystem, because I think we see, I, uh, you know, we've had tens and tens conversation with local VCs, private equity and companies the last few months because of our portfolio. We wanted to make sure we understand how does our portfolio look like and uh, how stable it is. And what was very much surprising is to hear most of the CEOs talking about liquidity, which they've never been concerned before, about their uh, burn rate. And, uh, and I think that uh, um, for the first time, we are, they are talking about cash flow, because up until now, you've in a company com coming to raise funds, uh, that's satisfied for six months, 10 months, they will raise another fund uh, 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 um, in, in a year from now. And now you're hearing the CEOs talking about having liquidity for a year and a half, 18, 24 months, in case something will happen. And I think I have to tell you, Jonathan, I like this phenomena. I like to see the young entrepreneurs talking about cost savings. Cash so flows. <laughs> yes, cash flow. What? You don't know what cash flow is. You know, I'm going to ask them about DCF. They're going to go crazy. And they would th think it's a, a new world. World. So basically, I think this is changing, and, and I think it's a good. It's a good thing. I'm just smiling because I come from that world, and and it's a novel concept. And you know, actually, I, we used to define an entrepreneur as somebody who, who can take one dollar and stretch three dollars out of it. So. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, the, the startups are talking about cash flow and the hotel operators are talking about burn rate. So, <laughs> so yes. um, but I think, you know, we're getting here to the top of the hour. We still have another few questions that we didn't manage to get to. But, uh, but I think overall, I think the message, um, uh, you, you know, it's nice to hear that uh, the Israeli companies are getting to a certain level of maturity, like you just now talked about, Hila. I think that's actually very healthy. I think that was a change that we also saw in the tech industries back after the bubble burst of 2001, where all of a sudden companies realized that just having the word internet in the business plan isn't, should not be enough to raise capital. And there was a much healthier approach and really you see today sustainable companies. So I think, you know, this kind of transition is actually healthy because that means that they're starting to think about sustainability and not just about the next great idea. So 
I actually see that as a as a great positive sign. I mean, result of the times, but it's a it's a good positive sign. Uh, but I think overall, just to summarize what we've been hearing here is that. I mean, are there storms, uh, possible uh, clouds and um, storm clouds out there? Definitely. I think uh, if they weren't, uh, this would not be a realistic conversation. Nobody would take it seriously. I don't think anybody can, uh, would think that it's just going to be an upward trajectory. Uh, but I think overall what I hear is a very positive message for, uh, from all of you that Israel should definitely be in the portfolio of an investor today, of the modern day investor, not just uh, because of a sense of Israel or a sense of loyalty towards Israel, but really, and uh, bottom line is that it just makes sense, makes financial sense. And, uh, you know, so, um, you know, so, so I, I thank you all for this. Uh, I thank you all for, uh, for this messaging. And, and uh, I just want to uh, thank everybody again for joining us uh, over here uh, in this webinar. Uh, it's one more webinar, as I indicated. It's our 25th uh, webinar on the series that we've been doing now twice a week, uh, both uh, trying to bring information as well as uh, trying to sort of provide some uh, relief uh, from this uh, time period. And uh, we will continue with the, uh, with the series throughout the summer. So please uh, do stay tuned. You can visit us on our website uh, and, and follow us uh, on social media uh, to be able to uh, know uh, what the next great session is. Uh, so once again, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the panelists. This has been a fascinating conversation. I think we can probably continue for another three hours and, and without taking a break, but uh, I will not do that to you. So thank you very much, everybody. Stay thank good, you. stay safe and stay healthy. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Thanks for the great thank questions. Thank you. Thanks, bye.